our top sto first story tonight by Jupiter. It's quite a beautiful planet. Um, t uh, Thomas, can we take the lights down a bit? There's a little uh, a bit of spillage onto the, onto the um, screen here. Okay, that's good. Thank you. All right. So uh, every once a year, uh, Jupiter gets into uh, what's called opposition, okay, where the Sun and Jupiter on the, are on the opposite sides of Earth. Well, this is the point in Jupiter's orbit when it is closest to Earth, because you can see that if it were located anywhere else around its circle, around its orbital circle, um, it would be further from Earth. So the best viewing, uh, its closest point, is at opposition. Also, it's its best viewing because it's up exactly opposite the sun, so it's not, uh, not, uh, not up at sunset, not up at sunrise, where you have interference of that, um, and you can see it. Now, Hubble doesn't have to worry about that too much, because Hubble can, doesn't have to, <laughs> Hubble's up in, up in space, and it doesn't have to worry about, you know, daytime versus nighttime, because, you know, it doesn't have the atmosphere to look through. However, we often take pictures of the planets when, we, when they are at opposition. And you might think to yourself, well, we've had missions that go to the planets. What can Hubble offer? And I sometimes look at these, these press releases we do and go, okay, but you know what? Sometimes we just get it right. So this is our picture of Jupiter at opposition from uh, this year. Isn't that cool? I mean, I remember when we had to have the Voyager missions to go across I could go across interplanetary space to get something that looked this gorgeous. And I just love all of the hydrodynamic effects, okay? I'm a, I'm a sucker for, for uh, all the hydrodynamic effects of the, the vortices and the swirls in, in Jupiter's atmosphere. Plus, you'll notice we've got not only the great red spot, but also we have what we colloquially call Red Spot Junior, officially called Oval BA. I much prefer Red Spot Junior. And Red Oval BA formed in the year 2000, okay? We had never seen a second red spot until it actually, well, it formed as a white, red, white spot and then turned red a few years later. But it has now been around for almost 15, 15 20 years, okay? So we're seeing a second red spot on Jupiter and it appears to be long lived. But I just thought this was a really wonderful uh, and beautiful image of Jupiter. Our second story tonight is also from the solar system, Europa's Old Faithful. All right, so first of all, let's make sure everyone remembers what Old Faithful is. Old Faithful is the geyser in Yellowstone National Park that erupts approximately every 90 minutes. Is that right? Is that about 90 minutes or is it longer than that? Yes, Karen's way, saying yes, which is actually incidentally about the same time it takes orbit, Hubble to orbit around Earth. So every time Hubble passes over, Old Faithful erupts, right? <laughs> Not quite. Um, and so this is a geyser from Hot Springs, okay? Um, and so the idea is that the water spews up 100 feet in the air or so, right? Well, if you remember, if you were here last year, I told you about seeing a plume on Europa that spews out a little bit further than 100 feet. All right, so you got to understand this image, okay? First of all, um, the plume is in white, which is really pulled out of the data. It's really hard to see this. It's actually seen in shadow against the, the surface of Jupiter. So Europa is passing in front of, of Jupiter, and we're seeing that plume in shadow. It's been reversed here so that you can see it as white. And then the picture of Europa here is not from Hubble. This is actually from the Galileo mission. All right, as remember I said, we get missions that have been there, they got better pictures. So to give you an idea of what we're seeing, we've taken the Hubble data, stretched it in contrast so you can see the plume, because it's really tiny there, um, and then thrown the Galileo image on top of it, okay? This is what I told you about last year. Well, we looked again to try and see if this was a recurring event, and yes, it is. We are seeing another plume. Now, we don't see it every time we look for it, okay? We have done this observation multiple times. Sometimes we see it, sometimes we don't, which gave me the sort of uh, instance of Old Faithful that it sometimes erupts and sometimes doesn't. What does this mean? Well, the surface of Europa, if you look at it in detail, resembles cracked ice rafts on, 
uh, uh, in the Arctic. This is actually the surface of Europa. And you can see all the ices and all the cracks in it, okay? All right, and when we're, because we're able to time when, it, uh, when we saw this plume and where it was on, 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 the, on the moon, we're able to narrow down to where we thought the plume was coming from to these cracks here on Europa, all right? And the idea was to say, all right, why would these cracks be emitting uh, water vapor? Well, turns out that a temperature measure of the surface of Europa shows that that area is three degrees warmer than the rest. Now, you have to recognize three degrees warmer is going from 92 Kelvin to 95 Kelvin. And this is an absolute scale. So this is minus a couple hundred degrees Fahrenheit, okay? So when I say warmer, I really should be saying three degrees less totally, absolutely frigid, okay? Um, but they, it is actually warmer. So the idea behind all this, all right? The idea behind our understanding of Europa is we have understood that underneath its icy surface, there is probably a liquid water layer. Now, originally, we thought that that icy, icy crust was about 100 kilometers thick. And if you wanted to sample the water, you'd have to drill down through 100 kilometers, which is not a very easy task. However, if we're seeing these plumes and we're seeing them more than once, it may indicate that there are pockets of water, maybe not the ocean underneath a layer, but maybe there are pockets of water that are just a few kilometers down in the ice. I, if you remember what we learned about Pluto last year, cryotectonics is really much more important in the outer solar system than we'd really understood. So we learned that also about Europa, that the ices move and crack and, and, and the, the, the dynamics of ices um, is a lot more than we had previously suspected. And in perhaps there are pockets of water that are one, two, few kilometers down, then that raises the prospect for being able to go there, drill down to it or melt down to it and be able to sample it. Now, why would we care about water? Well, because there are three things required for life in the universe as we know it. One is carbon. Carbon's everywhere. Two is a source of heat. We got sources of energy all over the place. And three is water. So our search for life in the universe is often just boiled down to a search for water. Wherever liquid water can exist, perhaps life can exist. And we have seen life in all sorts of extreme places here on Earth. So Europa is one of our strongest candidates for possibly having life elsewhere in the solar system. And the observations from Hubble have done yet another small part in convincing us that, hey, this is a really cool system. We ought to continue to investigate it. And yes, it's become one of our main um, uh, points of study for trying, to, under, trying to, to look for life in our solar system. All right, third story tonight. Our 27th anniversary, Perspectives on Spiral Galaxies. The 27th anniversary is of this event, the launch and deployment of the Hubble Space Telescope. It has been 27 years. Isn't that great? All right, we've been up there for 27 years doing science. And so every year they ask us to do a really cool uh, image for the, 20, for, for, for the anniversary. And it's, I gotta say, um, one of the gentlemen who cho helps choose these images is in the audience right now, and he can confirm that it's really, really hard to keep out doing themse themselves every year. So this year, we chose some spiral galaxies, okay? And these spiral galaxies are in the Virgo cluster. So we're gonna zoom in from a wide field view. I'm gonna go, keep going down and going down and zooming in until we come into these two spiral galaxies, NGC 4302 and NGC 4298. Such wonderful names. And those are the two spiral galaxies we chose uh, for the, the Hubble 27th anniversary image. Now, if you notice at the end of that movie, it zoomed in in visible light and then switched to infrared. So let me show you those in detail. Here is the Hubble image uh, using visible light, all right, and this is the infrared view, all right, using the, uh, the, 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 infra the near infrared capabilities of Hubble. So visible light, infrared light. And you can see 
that you can s the, 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 the difference in how we view the galaxies changes according to the wavelength in which we view them. Well, we also wanted to give you another perspective on them. So we created this visualization to help you understand the shape of these spiral galaxies. And so by rotating those galaxies in 3D, by the way, those are just computer models of the galaxies. We don't know the exact details. Matter of fact, the galaxy on the left, NGC 4302, um, the model that we used is a, a model based on the galaxy M51, the Whirlpool galaxy. Because we're seeing that galaxy edge on, we really can't tell the true three-dimensional structure, so we had to use, as I like to say, a stunt double galaxy for it. Uh, but that gives you a mental model of what you're seeing in this image. And when I show you another image, which is also in the Virgo cluster, I show you this image of all these various spiral galaxies. You now have the mental model in your head to interpret this and say, okay, these are all pretty much those same disc-shaped galaxies, but seen at different angles. So in doing this, you gain a mental model of, of how spiral galaxies look, and you can see them in perspective. You can translate images such as this.